today we're continuing to talk about a critical approach to popular culture. Today, specifically, we're getting into chapter three by David Grazian called Welcome to the Machine, a critical approach to popular culture. Grazian says, quote, the ascendance of certain kinds of pop culture can be explained by the enormous economic and cultural power of the mass media industry. What we're going to be doing here is talking about the culture industry from the top down. We, what we need to do if we want to understand popular culture, we need to look at the owners of popular culture. Culture industry will be a key term as the chapter continues. For now, know that the definition of culture industry is specifically to connect culture to other mass-produced commodities, from sodas to cars, fashion to music. And we're going to be discussing the darker aspects of popular culture, the fact that the there are very few multinational corporations that own the bulk of everything that we deal with. Um, oh, that's getting to the next screen. What, what we can say here is that I love this picture. Notice here, work eight hours, sleep eight hours, play eight hours, conform, stay asleep, watch TV, sleep, no thought, submit, buy, obey, consume. These are the directives that if you really pay close attention, popular culture gives us in our everyday life. I also went with this picture of a bunch of, looks like, almost, looks like all white folks sitting, watching a movie with their 3D glasses, all look completely hypnotized by the screen in front of them. There's no reflexivity here. There's conformity. There is uniformity. There is everybody doing what they're supposed to. And finally, the picture of the marionette, where we're all puppets connected to screens going forward. And this helps look at the darker aspects of popular culture. Again, we have few multinational corporations. I found, I mean, there's a, a million of these graphs. This one's specifically about food. You can see, looking at any of these, that you know, Kraft doesn't just make mac and cheese. It owns everything all the way down to A&W root beer and uh, like Welch's uh, fruit snacks, right? That everything gets fully incorporated here. So there's very few multinational corporations that control everything that we do. Um, you have the perpetuation of stereotypes. Here we have a very much uh, Stedford wife looking woman who is vacuuming and picking up the couch while her lazy ass husband sits there and reads the newspaper and smokes a pipe and the little girl is just sitting there mesmerized by the television um, so here we have the perpetuation of uh, the housewife cleaning and the dad being la uh, lazy um, and then of course we have things that manufacture our desires uh, and what I think is important here is Disney. The overall question about Disney World is why do people go to Disney World? And the fact is, a lot of people I know, it's not about going and experiencing Disney World. It's seeing your kids experience Disney World. Most people take their kids at far too young of an age for them to even remember the experience, but they're there to take pictures. Just this weekend, I went to Hall's Farm, 
right? The pumpkin patch up in South Lake. How many of you have ever been there? Just a handful, because most of y'all probably haven't had kids yet. What happens is you go there, um, and number one, they started charging about a year or two ago just to get in. Uh, so my mother-in-law was in town. My wife is trying to think of, like, what can I go do with my mom? So we go there, and we've been taking my son there since he was a, a newborn. Um, or I guess maybe not a newborn since he was seven months old at that point. But anyway, since he was seven months old. And I'm walking around, and he's getting grumpy, and I mentioned to my wife, which wasn't the best thing to mention, but there are no, I said, look, there are no kids the age of Owen here. Because he's nine. It was all really little kids with parents, like, posing them for pictures, creating this memory, right? Manufacturing a desire. And that's what you get here in Disney World. People want the pictures. They want the memory of their kids having fun, seeing Mickey Mouse for the first time, right? But it's not about the kid having fun on, I don't know, um, Space Mountain or something. That's not the goal. The goal is the manufactured desire. And it's also, uh, the darker aspects, is about molding human minds, especially children. And one of the things, again, with Disney is it creates lifelong brand connections. As children, we start, as infants, we start connecting with particular brands. And then we stick with these brands uh, our whole life. So to return to this thing with both Coca-Cola and PepsiCo are there. How many Coca-Cola people do I have in here? How many Pepsi people? So it seems like far more Coca-Cola. Probably shouldn't be saying this on a recording because UTA is a Pepsi company now. And we're not, we can't get, or Pepsi University, we're not even allowed to get reimbursed if we, like if I bought water from Aquafina, which is a Coke product, I think that's right, or am I have it backwards? Whatever. Um, I couldn't get, oh, it's up here. If I purchased Dasani, then I can't get reimbursed. I have to buy Aquafina. At the end of the day, the whole point is we get brand identities and we stick with them our whole lives. Now, what I like to think about here is what does it mean to consume? What does it mean to be a consumer? And the importance that I want to draw into the idea of consumer and consumption um, is that consumption does not happen as a direct result of production. If it did, there would be no need for advertising or marketing. People only consume after we're told about it. So if I come up with a genius product and I just go, hey, to y'all, I'm going to sell this genius product. How many people am I going to sell that to? Maybe like one or two people. A fraction of this class, right? But nobody outside of this class, because I didn't tell them about it. If you want to sell a product, you have to have money to market, to tell people that this thing is here. So there are two main purposes to focus on consumption. First, it's a crucial element uh, in the cultural circuit. And you have to remember, as I mentioned, uh, when we were talking about the cultural circuit with Duguay, um, meaning making is an ongoing process. If it wasn't a process, there would be no need for advertising. 
and meanings are not made in the factory. Some meanings are made through usage. So why do people use a particular good? Well, because they end up doing it a certain way. As I told you with the Walkman, it initially had two jacks on it. But then when people realized, when Sony realized that only one jack was ever used, they got rid of the second jack. And then they marketed it as an individual thing, not a, a collective. So it's through this that changes happen. And the other reason to talk about consumption is to introduce theories about culture. For instance, the idea of taste. One way to think about consumption is through classical economics. In classical economics, Duguay says that, quote, consumption usually refers to the purchase of a product and its exchange value or price. The focus in classical economics is primarily on exchange. But you can also talk about final consumption. And that means that a good can no longer be used. So if you consume an apple, can anybody else consume that apple? No, it's gone. It's in your belly. So unless you throw it up like a bird to feed a child, which just doesn't work in the human system because then you're going to have a bunch of stomach acid that would burn their mouth. So you don't try that. Um, final consumption, it's gone. Um, so eating something or a service. Now for me, the thing that I like to think about and talk about with consumption is the question of file sharing. Or today in stream. If I file share a file, if I give one of you a recording of a song in an MP3, can I still use it? Yeah. Yes. So it's not final consumption, right? And again, if I give you a file, is something being exchanged? Is it an exchange if you're just obtaining something without getting the return? In this term, something else needs to be given. Now, there's a whole set of anthropological theories that go along with the idea of the gift. And is a gift ever really free? Or is it a social relationship that's being traded on? In terms of classical economics, though, no exchange is happening if I just give you a file. I can still use it. You can use it. No consumption is happening. So one of the ironies when people talk about music is they often talk about consuming music. But in essence, if you're consume, if you're listening to music, you're not consuming it. It has nothing to do with the definition. And when we talk about consumption of music or television or a video game or um, YouTube videos as consumption, then the assumption is already that something is being exchanged. And we're already talking about an economic frame to talk about the use, enjoyment of popular culture. I think that it's really important to separate these two. Otherwise, you give all the agency, all the power to large multinational corporations that dictate to you that, in fact, popular culture does have exchange value. And there is a difference between exchange value and use value. Use value has everything to do with the usefulness of a thing. Whereas exchange value is all about money. 
So there are the markers are over there. The exchange value of this marker doesn't matter to me. I'm using it in this classroom, right? And its use value is, is when I have a bunch of writing up here, I can go, oh, and erase it and not use my hand and get ink all over my hand and then all over everything else. So there is an important distinction to make there between use value and exchange value. And when we focus too much on exchange value, then it, that is to say that popular culture is only as good as it is value, uh, it's, as it is in its money value. Another way to talk about consumption goes back to Raymond Williams. And with Raymond Williams, consumption is associated with waste. And in this example, a fire consumes a house. Once the fire goes on, there's waste produced, the house can no longer be used. It's slightly different than the um, uh, kind of final consumption idea in um, classical economics because is the house supposed to be consumed by fire? Yeah. Is that an act of like positive consumption? No, that's different from eating an apple. But we do use the term there to say it is consumed. An important thinker, as we discussed last class, to think about a critical approach to popular culture, the first critical theorist was Karl Marx. And Karl Marx wrote uh, a piece called The German Ideology. And in it, Grazian says that Marx argues that the prevailing ideologies and cultural norms of any society serve to benefit its ruling classes and perpetuate their power. Um, so this long quote is in Grazian. It comes from a German ideology translated by Tucker. Um, but so here, I'm going to read this out loud and then we can talk about it. Um, the ideas of the ruling class are in every epic the ruling ideas, i.e., the class which is the ruling material force of society is at the same time its ruling intellectual force. The class which has the means of material production at its disposal has control at the same time over the means of mental production. So that thereby, generally speaking, the ideas of those who lack the means of mental production are subject to it. Now, what does all that mean? Basically, if you think about it, the wealthy in any given society have time, they have money. They can either spend that time creating ideology or they can spend their money paying people to create ideology. And the way this ends up happening, when you look at a university, for instance, When an organization, a foundation, or a corporation want a particular scientific thing discovered or researched, they, they send out a call for proposals for grants. And they have in their rules very specific ideas about what will apply to that grant. And Basically, researchers then go, oh, look, I study something similar to that. I can apply for this grant and do the research that they're asking and support them. And so then in the end, excuse me, the corporation or the wealthy individuals get exactly the world that they're hoping to look for through those grants. A great example of this is the Gates Foundation. The, 
Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, generally speaking, has a good or great goal to it. They want to figure out ways to educate disadvantaged youth. Poor people, people of color, getting them into better universities, getting them a great education. But they start with a set of assumptions about how to meet that goal. And the only grants that they approve are if you write and do the research for their preconceived view of what education should be. So if you have a completely different idea about how to educate, educate people and the best way to lift people out of poverty that goes against the dominant ideas that the Gates Foundation holds, you don't get funding. So that's one way. Another way, some of you may have heard of the Koch brothers. One Koch brother died. It was, it was much sexier to talk about the Koch brothers a decade ago. Um, but they are billionaires. And they often fund um, university programs across the country. And my PhD alma mater, George Mason University, was the biggest recipient of Koch money. And they set up what was called, uh, or what is called, the Mercatus Center. And the Mercatus Center produces economic theories and policies that are based on the ideas that um, the Koch brothers support. The Koch brothers have most their money in uh, oil, gas, and paper products, things that destroy the earth. So what can you expect from uh, economists who are doing these things, things that hurt the earth, right? Oh, it's no problem to pollute that. There's, there's, these are uh, economic externalities or something, right? That's how ideology gets produced. And what it creates is ideology is an upside down vision of reality that makes common sense to us, but perpetuates the position of the ruling class. And Karl Marx calls it a chimera obscura. And that's what I have a picture of here with these um, candles. So notice here, and some of you may have heard about this before. It's something that they still use in the art world sometimes. But back before the camera was invented, what they realized was if you created a box and you put a tiny hole in it, and there was lots of light outside, an image of the outside would get projected on the ups on the back end of the box, but it would be upside down, it would be refracted. So what they would do is they would sit inside the box, an artist would sit inside, they'd sketch it really quickly, then they'd flip it back right side up and paint it in. So that's the predecessor, right? So when you take a picture with a camera, it's got a series of mirrors to flip it right side up. So Marx describes ideology as a chimera obscura. But the important point here is that the ruling class has the time and money to produce ideology. The next person to think about here is Antonio Gramsci. And we discussed him earlier in, in the semester. Um, but to kind of remind you, Gramsci uh, was a Italian politician. He was elected to the Italian uh, parliament, their equivalent of Congress, uh, and he was a communist. So he was an elected communist in Italy. Along comes Benito Mussolini, the famous fascist from World War II, um, and he imprisoned all his opponents. So Antonio Gramsci ends up in prison. Prison in the 1920s in Italy was not a pretty place. Um, he wrote a series of notebooks called the Prison Notebooks. On any given random day, the prison guards would give him just a random notebook and he would write on it. 
So it can be really confusing to read his stuff. Um, but he is locked in prison. He's also writing on toilet paper. Um, again, I wouldn't, I'd hate to know what uh, 1920s prison, Italian prison toilet paper felt like. But if it was hard enough for him to write on, it's not something I want to use. Um, I most definitely cannot write on my toilet paper. Um, and he comes up with a theory that he called hegemony. Um, hegemony is the prevailing power in society. There is no outside of hegemony. It's the world we live in. It's the ideas that we're given. It's the way we understand the world around us. Now, if we were back in uh, the Cold War, political science, tend to use the term hege hegemony to talk about prevailing power in a society and that there are multiple hegemonies. So in the Cold World, there was uh, bipolar hege he hegemony, which was the United States in the West and the USSR in the East. They had their spheres of political power influence. Um, that is not at all Gramsci's point. Gramsci's concerned about cultural hegemony. And as I wrote here, um, culture has the ideological power to help aid social control. Grazian says, quote, on page 50, societies may be even more seamlessly controlled through the dissemination of mass media because it disarms and immobilizes its audience by engineering popular consensus through the power of persuasion. Cultural hegemony is important with Antonio Gramsci because we consent to it. If, as we discussed most as, as we discussed last class, most people are poor and there are very few wealthy, what keeps the system the way it is? Well, the answer is we get something out of it. So we consent to that system. That's how cultural hegemony works. And when we think specifically about culture, we all, yeah, we got to work. We got to bust our butt. But at the end of the day, we can go home, watch TV, drink a beer, and forget about the world, right? And maybe we watch uh, last night, Monday Night Football. Maybe you um, are obsessed with reality television or um, like to watch HGTV and dream about the house that you're never going to buy, right? All these things, we get something out of it. Whereas something like the idea of revolution Sure, you might not be getting anything right now that's great, but you also don't know what you're going to lose. And most people don't want to get up, give up the paltry things that they do have. So cultural hegemony is all about giving up something and consenting to the power that is because you do get something out of it. This brings me to my favorite, the Frankfurt School. The Frankfurt School were, uh, and it's called the Frankfurt School because they were at the University of Frankfurt in Germany. They were a group of German Jews who had an uh, institute, I can't think, off the top of my head with the name of the institute. Oh, here we go. The Institute for Social Research at the University of Frankfurt. So we have a group of Jewish intellectuals doing social scientific research in Germany. And along comes the rise of the Nazi party. Many of them escaped and made their way to America. Um, the three that I listed there on top, Theodore Adorno, Herbert Marcuse, and Max Horkheimer, 
They all escaped, made it to the United States. Um, so did Leo Lowenthal, Eric Fromm, Frederick Pollock. All these people were uh, ended up establishing themselves in the United States. One of them did not make it to the United States. Social theorist named Walter Benjamin. He went to France. France falls to the Vichy government. The Nazis move in. He's running around. He had written this piece called The Arcade, Arcades Project. He was trying to um, smuggle it into uh, Switzerland at the border. He was about to get caught by Nazis, so he committed suicide. I give this all to you to tell you the Frankfurt School are not optimists by and large. Their work, especially Theodore Adorno, who is my favorite, is incredibly pessimistic, incredibly dire. Um, so they escape Nazi Germany, and, and Walter Benjamin's project, the Arcades Project, did make it to publication. You can buy it, you can read it, it's real, it's like this thick. Um, the arcades in France were basically the predecessors to shopping malls. So again, to think about popular culture and consumption, he was just hanging out at these arcades, um, writing about them, thinking about the role of consumption in our everyday life. But Adorno and Horkheimer especially, they arrive in the United States, they look around and they go, what the fuck? Everywhere they look, they see fascism in 1930s, 1940s United States of America. But it operates differently from what they observed in Germany. In some ways it operates the same way. Um, when the United States government imprisoned Japanese Americans in concentration camps. When the, uh, we have Jim Crow in the South, lynching of African Americans going on at the same time um, that Jews are being persecuted in Germany. Really no different in the United States of America in those terms. Granted, we didn't have um, mass extermination going on in the United States in the same way, but it was very oppressive. But that's not what they focused on. What they focused on was the oppression that happens culturally in the United States. Um, and so the work that they wrote, one of them was the dialectic of enlightenment. The dialectic of enlightenment looks at the way myth got overthrown during the uh, bourgeois revolution through the enlightenment. People became enlightened and they did away with myth and science became the new myth. And you can see that today, people who don't understand science, and they just reject it wholesale. The fact that there are flat earthers today, people who believe that getting a COVID vaccine is injecting them with some kind of thing that George Soros can then control them with. A complete un-understanding, I don't want to say misunderstanding, a complete refusal to understand because science itself has been constructed as its own myth. So in the dialectic of enlightenment and the dire circumstances that they're talking about, one of the chapters is all about the culture industry, which is the primary thing that we're talking about here. But they also talk about the use of science for mass destruction. Science, we're always told, brings us progress, right? 
Y'all have all heard this. Science brings progress. But scientific rationality during World War II brought us two forms of mass extermination. The first was the Holocaust. The scientific rationality of imprisoning people working them as slaves, but not to live for a long term as slaves, but to work them to their death. And then when they could not work any longer, put them in a gas chamber. That was the one, the extermination of six million Jews during World War II. The other what was the other mass extermination event during World War II that was scientific? The nuclear bomb. The nuclear bomb. The United States of America developed the nuclear bomb, dropped it on Nagasaki and Hiroshima, killing instantaneously hundreds of thousands of people. And over the decades that followed, millions more. This was scientific rationality at its worst. The idea that the development of a bomb that can bring annihilation of entire cities in a split second, and that that should happen for scientific progress, that's what Adorno and Horkheimer were reacting to. So when I say they looked around and they saw fascism everywhere, that was the problem. But it also operated through culture. So what they write about is, to move on there, the expansion of um, consumption in the 20th century. And so as Duguay says, quote, the growing importance of leisure and consumption activities. There was, with the growth of capitalism, a need for more consumer goods. The more people work and do a job to create things, you end up with oversupply of a good. And when you hit oversupply of a good, you have too much stuff, what happens to the workers at that point? Well, they've been overworked. Now they've created too much stuff. They're let go. They're laid off. They're made redundant. They lose their job. And then the whole economy crashes. So what um, capitalists started realizing in the 20th century is one thing to do is to create more consumer goods. So that the more things that people make, the more that people can consume and spend their money on and that can keep the entire system going. And a lot of this happens in the cultural sector. And so Grazian says that it's, quote, to invent new and largely useless desires for consumer goods. And the problem is that this expansion of consumption leads to domination and mass manipulation. Commodities become ubiquitous. They're everywhere. And as Duguay said, the same commodity logic and instrumental rationality manifest in the productive apparatus now saturates all other realms of existence. That is leisure, the arts, culture. Everything becomes a commodity that we consume. This is Theodore Adorno, and he said, the power of the culture industry's ideology is such that conformity has replaced consciousness. We're more interested in conforming than thinking. Now, the reason why people don't tend to like uh, the Frankfurt School is their pessimism. And all they want to do is think, no action. Because at the end of the day, when you commit action, 
action often is not fully thought through and that creates more domination, exploitation, and oppression. So, for instance, the Bolshevik Communist Revolution in the USSR, the theory was, oh, if we create a economic revolution, everything else will be create equality. But this couldn't be further from the truth. You still had racial and religious uh, domination. You still had gender uh, discrimination. You still had all these things that existed in society. Um, so, you know, Stalin comes to power in the USSR, and what did he do? Killed millions and millions of people because of who they were, or because of who the threat that they may have uh, represented. So, the Frankfurt School comes up with the culture industry's perspective. And that is the idea that you have culture from Duguay, which is, quote, possessing connotations of refinement, learning, and aesthetic contemplation. And you mix that with the idea of industry, which directly links to capitalism. So, culture industry is a term that is used to demonstrate a relationship to the masses. But, they don't use the term mass culture. Because mass culture sounds like the term has a, a connotation of culture emanating from the masses. The culture industry reverses this relationship and it recognizes that what you're really experiencing is homogenized culture that articulates power. It comes from the top, not from the bottom. So, Grazian says that the 21st century, quote, is ever increasing hegemony and consolidated economic power of the culture, culture industry. The global proliferation of their market tested products, and what some regard as an overall lowering of cultural standards along the way. And so, what's important here, and what I want you to think about before I go to the next slide cultural workers are workers too. Cultural workers are exploited just like all other workers. And with the development and uh, proliferation of the culture industry, it's our consumption of popular culture that actually oppresses a whole nother realm of workers. And where we see this, for instance, is Everybody in here, once you graduate from college, you're working a job full time, you save up some money so that on the weekend you can go watch a movie. Right? And in that movie, in that moment when you're watching the movie, your hope is that it releases you from the miserable conditions that you live under. Right? For just an hour and a half to three hours, uh, you get to sit down, watch this movie, and forget about how much your work life sucks. But in that instance, if you go to a movie theater, you have all the workers that work at the movie theater that are making at or just above minimum wage to be there, and you have all the people who distributed and produced the movie to make it all the way to the movie theater, then you have everybody that works in or at the movie uh, studio that produced the movie, whether that's the actors or the camera persons or the people that the costume designers or makeup artists 
all those people go into the production of that movie. So really, what you're doing by watching the movie, while you feel like you're getting out of the system by just kind of zoning out for a little bit, uh, you're really creating more oppression in the system. 